Welcome to the Wisdom That Breathes channel. Across all our platforms, we try to share wisdom which is relevant and accessible to everyone. But on this particular platform, we go deeper into some of the ancient principles found within the scriptures. If you find some of the terminology difficult or inaccessible, then go over to our Keshava Swami YouTube channel where you'll be able to find other content which is perhaps more relatable. Thank you and enjoy the wisdom that breathes. Beautiful pastimes. So this uh, song is written by Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur. He himself in his final days was living um, very close to uh, Radha Kund and uh, it said that the great devotees they don't just write about these pastimes they're actually visualizing them in their heart uh, Krishna's pastimes are Nitya Leela so they're always going on somewhere in the material world somewhere of course eternally in the spiritual world but also in the hearts of the devotees so as we try to create the community of love outside of us, we try to absorb the community of love, which is the original community of love, Vrindavan, within our own hearts. So these uh, songs are very, very beautiful to uh, absorb these uh, divine interactions. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh. 
begun two days ago talking about this beautiful concept on the slide here is a beautiful verse from the fourth canto which is often quoted talking about how the sons of Prachina Barishad, the Prachetas, they were requested by their father to procreate in the world and before they did so they decided to go to perform austerities and they did so for 10,000 years underwater and they successfully completed those austerities and eventually had a darshan of the Supreme Lord but when the Supreme Lord appeared when the Supreme Lord appeared more impressed he was more impressed with their cooperation, their friendly spirit, their ability to actually live and function and cooperate and coexist together without any friction or conflict more than any of the other austerities that they were doing. And it's a very, very significant point that the blessings of the Lord really shower in a place where there is great unity, harmony and uh, cooperation. And so we talked about how Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu built this community of love and showed an archetype in Jagannath Puri through his beautiful interactions with the various Vaishnavas there. And we've been looking every single day um, at a different Vaishnav and um, what we can learn from the Supreme Lord's interaction with them and what ingredient that adds. So yesterday we talked about Rupa Goswami and how Rupa Goswami so much uh, symbolizes empowerment and how in a community of love everyone is trying to empower each other. Everyone has something unique to give and everyone also has some weaknesses. So where there is appreciation and empowerment it helps us to overcome the weaknesses and it helps us to individually unleash our full potential. And so, where there is always great encouragement and appreciation of each other, then this community becomes very, very strong and each individual becomes stronger and that in turn strengthens everyone else. We then talked about Haridas Thakur and how Haridas Thakur really symbolizes spiritual strength because in the face of sickness, in the face of suffering, in the face of sense gratification, his uh, connection with the process of the chanting of the holy names never diminished, never reduced, never in any way became weakened. And in a community where we have uh, pillars of strength like this, that is the pillars upon which a community can grow um, in, in un to unimaginable heights. And so we talked about how Individually, we can all lend our spiritual strength by our own practice to inspiring uh, everyone around us. And this is uh, also a very, very important um, aspect of the community. So today, we're going to now move on to the fourth chapter of the Ante Lila, <coughs> where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has very, very beautiful interaction now with Sanatan Goswami. <coughs> when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had met the Goswamis, then he had given them various instructions. Um, he had told them, Bhakti, uh, Krishna Bhakti, Krishna Prem, Tatvedani Dhar, Vaishnava Era Kritya Ara, Vaishnava Achar, Krishna Bhakti, Krishna Prema Seva Pravartan, Lupta Tirtha Udara Ara, Veda Gyashikshan. In these two verses, Mahaprabhu gives the Goswamis the blueprint of how to actually formulate the Krishna consciousness movement. He says, Bhakti Bhakta Krishna Prem Tatvedani Dhar. Write down in literature the truths which underpin devotion, 
the character of a devotee and their relationship of love with the Supreme Person. So number one, write literatures. Vaishnaveda Kritya Ara Vaishnava Achar. And then he told them, through your example, show how a Vaishnava should behave, what kind of character a Vaishnava should have. Krishna Bhakti, Krishna Prem, Seva Pravartan. He said, number three, establish, it, establish centers of devotion where people can serve Krishna, um, temples where people can actually uh, simulate what it's like to be in the spiritual world. Look the dear to Udhara. And then he said, number four, excavate all the holy places that are being lost to the vision of the world. And then he said, Vairagya Shikshan, show the example of renunciation. So the two instructions, the first one uh, or the second one, uh, Vaishnaveda Kritya Ara Vaishnava Achar, Sanatan Goswami becomes the embodiment of that. He becomes the embodiment of culture, etiquette, and the ideals of Vaishnav behavior. And Vairagya Shikshan, uh, Ravanat Das Goswami, who we'll discuss next, he becomes the embodiment of that. His incredible level of detachment and renunciation sets uh, such a high standard. And so with Sanatan Goswami, <coughs> His escape to be with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was more complicated. He was involved in the uh, Muslim occupational government in a more uh, perhaps uh, difficult capacity for him to leave. And therefore, uh, eventually he began calling in sick. The Nawab found him. Finally, he got imprisoned. He escaped from jail. He met Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he ended up in Vrindavan. But just like Rupa Goswami who had gone to Vrindavan but still wasn't satisfied and came back to meet Mahaprabhu in Jagannath Puri, Sanatan Goswami did the same. And so Sanatan Goswami, although having in his initial meeting with Mahaprabhu in Varanasi, he came again to Jagannath Puri to have a meeting with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. On his way to Jagannath Puri, he was sleeping wherever he could, he was eating whatever he could, and he said that on the way to Puri, he contacted a very bad skin disease. So he arrived in Jagannath Puri, but in a very bad health condition. Uh, his body was covered in blisters um, from uh, the uh, unclean waters that he had bathed in. And uh, when he came to Puri, what kind of made matters worse is the Supreme Lord was so happy to see him that the Supreme Lord, without a... Uh, uh, a blink of an eyelid without any second thought just would embrace him every time he saw Sanatan Goswami and that made Sanatan Goswami feel so bad in his heart that Sanatan Goswami had resolved that this body has become useless for service and this body is defiling the body of the Supreme Lord therefore I should give this body up and therefore he decided that he would um, give his body up and he would do that by uh, jumping underneath the Rathi in the uh, in the company of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu on that festival day. And when Mahaprabhu heard his plans, the Mahaprabhu chastised him. He said, you have already given your body to me. And therefore, how can you damage that which is not your own property? And he said to Sanatana Goswami, I have many things that I want to achieve through your body. And therefore, uh, don't contemplate uh, doing this act of suicide. Uh, you must continue on. And so like this, Sanatan Goswami continued on. And on one particular day, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu invited Sanatan Goswami to come and take lunch with him. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was living in Yameshwara Tota. And he sent a message to Sanatan Goswami that please come and join me for lunch. So Sanatan Goswami, with his bodily condition, was already feeling low because he had, you know, taken occupation in the Muslim government, he had bad association, and according to all of his calculations, he was um, unqualified in all respects. And so finally, he decided, because the Supreme Lord was calling him to come, and when he came, Mahaprabhu asked him, how did you come here? What route did you take? 
Now the shortest route to come from where uh, Sanatan Goswami was, Siddha Bakul, to where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was, was to just walk straight by the Jagannath temple. However, Sanatan Goswami took the long route around and went right by the uh, boiling hot sands of the Jagannath beach. And he came via that route. He said that Sanatan Goswami's whole body was covered in blisters and the only place which wasn't covered in blisters was the soles of his feet. But after coming via the Jagannath beach to come and see Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, even his feet had become covered with blisters. So Mahaprabhu said, why did you come that way? The, you know, the midday sun is so, uh, uh, so burning and the sand is so excruciating, nobody can stand. Why did you come that way? Why didn't you just come by the temple? And then he declared what he felt to be his fallen condition and said, I couldn't take the risk to come by the Jagannath temple just in case one of the pujaris who must maintain absolute cleanliness in the service of Jagannath, just in case by some chance they would come in contact with me, I would contaminate them. And when Mahaprabhu heard that, his, uh, he became... Uh, simultaneously shocked and simultaneously ecstatic. Shocked because he couldn't stand that Sanatan Goswami, who was the purest of all, uh, had undertaken such difficulty uh, unnecessarily in Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's eyes. But at the same time, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was so happy because he saw that this was a wonderful sign of Sanatan Goswami's culture, of how he was so sensitive in terms of how he interacts with people, how he interacts with the environment around him. And therefore Mahaprabhu, he uh, said this very, very beautiful thing. You can repeat after me. Tathapi Bhakta Sabhav Maryadya Rakshan Mariyada palana hoy sadhura abhushan Mariyada palana hoy bhakta swabhav mariyada rakshan Mariyada palana hoy sadhura abhushan Happy Bhakta Swabhav Mariada Rakshan Happy Bhakta Swabhav Mariada Rakshan Mariad Palanahoi Sadhira Bhushan My dear Sanatan, although you are the deliverer of the entire universe, and although even the demigods and great saints are purified by touching you, it is the characteristic of a devotee to observe and protect the Vaishnav etiquette. Maintenance of the Vaishnav etiquette is the ornament of a devotee. So the culture and the etiquette that a devotee embodies in their character uh, is extremely pleasing to the Supreme Lord and is the foundation of actually touching people's hearts and establishing deeper relationships. Without culture and etiquette, there is no question of a real meeting of hearts between individuals. Uh, Sanatan Goswami, although the embodiment of this, he also glorifies Haridas Thakur. Achar prachar kar hadui kariya tumi sarva guru tumi jagater arya. He says some people speak very well, but in their own achar, in their own behavior, culture, in their own etiquette, they don't act very well. And some people act very well, but they don't share with others. But because you do both, tumi sarva guru tumi jagater arya, you should be considered the spiritual master of the whole world. So how we carry ourselves, our culture, our behavior, this is such an important thing. Culture it ensures that relationships can go deeper. When there is a lack of culture, then there is a very good chance that we will misunderstand others. 
there's a very good chance that we will miscommunicate to others. There's a very good chance that when there's a lack of culture, our initial interactions may block a deeper meeting of hearts. In the world, they have something called anchoring bias. And what it means is that your first vision of someone or something counts for more and, and, and kind of uh, cements a certain conception within you that later on is very difficult to change. And therefore, culture and etiquette is so important because in the beginnings of relationships, when we don't know each other, culture and etiquette ensures that we can interact with people in such a way that we don't create any undue biases or bad conceptions that may later on block us from having a deeper relationship. So it's so important. Culture is so uh, central to a community. You, think, you can think of culture to be like language. If two people are trying to speak to each other and communicate, but they don't speak the same language, is very, very frustrating because they're trying to express something and the other person just can't understand them. And then they keep raising their voice, but the person can't understand because the language is different. So a uniform culture, a Vaishnav culture, uh, um, a kind of harmonious spiritual culture that everyone ascribes to and that everyone embodies and honors allows people to actually have uh, deeper relationships. One of the blessings and one of the curses, perhaps, of the Hare Krishna movement is that we are an international movement. And an international movement means it's beautiful because we come with so much variety, but it's also a minefield because we all come from such different cultures. And therefore, how many times have we seen that two devotees can be of great, uh, all in good intention, but because they have such different cultures, they can just misunderstand each other. Um, you know, it's like, once I was in India and uh, there was a devotee from London next to me, it was his first time in India. So we were taking prasadam and like, you know, halfway through the, uh, not halfway, like towards the end of the meal, my, my plate was empty and his plate was bigger than ever. And I could see he was also filled completely. So I was like, because I wasn't watching him while the thing was going on. So I said to him, like, why do you, you know, you're already full, so much pressure. He says, I don't know what to do. I keep saying no, and they keep giving me more. <laughs> so I was, I was telling him, this is, a, Indian culture is a shy culture. So when you say, you, when you want more, you never say yes. That's because it's, it's a shy culture. So when you went, want more, you never say yes. You just say like, no, no, no. no. And, they, and they understand, yes, he wants more. I told him, if you really want to tell them you don't want more, you have to say like, no, no. You have to put your hands over your plate. You have to like really tell them that because it's a shy culture. Whereas in our, you know, in Western culture, it's a very straight culture. You say what you mean and you just be straightforward. It even happens like this in management meetings, for example. Like Western culture means you just be very straightforward. You just speak your mind and that's what you do. That's clear. That's clear communication. But in Indian culture, you can't just be straight. You have to kind of, you know, you have to do it very... Uh, however you want to see it, you know, <laughs> don't be straight. <laughs> and uh, sometimes Western people can look at Indians and think like, these people are so uncultured, like why don't they just be straight? Why don't they just say what they think? You know, why do they just keep having to go in a roundabout way? And Indians can look at Westerners and think like, these people have no culture, you know, they just speak out their mind, they're just straight, they just, you know, they have no sensitivity of how to communicate it. <laughs> so like this, have, have you noticed how we have such different cultures? And uh, even humor, you know, like uh, the way uh, humor is in one culture, it can be offensive in another culture. 
So it's so important to have a universal spiritual culture that we all understand, that we all value, that we all ascribe to. And that culture and maintenance of it uh, allows us to connect more deeply. So in, in Vaishnav society, there's a culture of speech, how we should speak. Of course, Krishna gives the overriding culture of speech. Anudvega, karam vakyam, satyam, priyam, hitam jaya, swadhyaya, bhyasanam jeva, vanmayam, tapa uchyate. Krishna says he speak words which are truthful, words which are pleasing, words which are beneficial. Um, this is the overriding culture of speech. But then, of course, there are more subtleties in terms of how we communicate. When something is wrong, how do you communicate? When you want to share an idea, how, may, how do you communicate? When you want to um, glorify someone, how do you glorify them? These are also cultures of speech that should be understood because otherwise our speech can be very damaging to another person. In Vaishnav society, there's a culture of relationships. How do, we, how do men and women interact? There's a culture. How does the student and the teacher interact? There's a culture. How does one uh, interact with managerial authorities? There's a culture um, like this. How does one deal even with their own uh, parents? There's a culture. Srila Prabhupada was teaching this culture. Like, for example, when Brahmananda Prabhu and Garga Muni Prabhu were getting initiated and their mother came to the initiation ceremony, um, Srila Prabhupada taught Brahmananda Prabhu and Garga Muni Prabhu to bow down to their mother and touch her feet. That was a little strange for her. And then they recall later that, you know, they used to go home and when they used to knock on the door and she would open the door, they would pay obeisances. He said they didn't know what to do, so they would pay obeisances and chant Nama Om Vishnu Pada <laughs> while, while paying obeisances to the mother. So she's looking at like, who's here? And then they see someone at the floor. <laughs> so uh, Prabhupada was teaching all these things, um, culture. Srila Prabhupada taught... Um, social dealings, uh, even appearance, the culture of appearance. Early in the Christian consciousness movement, he would teach the ladies, if you part your hair like this, it means this. If you part your hair like this, it means this. Um, so everything carries a culture. Everything we display has meaning. And if we don't have a universal culture, then we can pick up on the wrong meanings um, and we can misjudge others. Uh, there is even culture in social dealings in, in Vaishnav community. Um, for example, it said if your enemy comes to your home, then when they leave, you should walk as far as the door. If your friend comes to your home and when they're leaving, you should walk as far as their vehicle. But if your very good friend comes and they leave, then you should go halfway to their destination with them. How practical that is, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe in uh, village culture it was more practical. But uh, like this, can you see how in everything there is a, there's a culture, there's a culture, um, not just speech, not just relationships, not just appearance, not just activities, there's a culture in terms of um, all aspects of how we conduct our social affairs, you know, how we cook, how we serve prasadam. All of this, we're picking up so much about other people and we're making so much conceptions on observations of how they move in this world. And because we have a certain concept of culture, they have a different concept of culture, then we're actually misjudging. And therefore Vaishnav culture brings unity. Vaishnav culture protects against offences. And Vaishnav culture also attracts uh, blessings. And therefore, uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told Sanatana Goswami, Vaishnavera Kritya Ar Vaishnava Achar. Uh, learn how to carry yourself in an appropriate way. This maintenance of the uh, Vaishnav culture will be uh, very, very beautiful. So, 
in all our communities we try to share this and teach this um, so that we can all benefit. So Sanatan Goswami really shows us this. And then as we move on in the Ante Lila to the next chapter, then we come to Raghunath Das Goswami. Raghunath Das Goswami's story of uh, meeting Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is really also an incredible story. Uh, he had, just like uh, Sanatan Goswami and Rupa Goswami, he had fell in love with the Supreme Lord and he was just waiting, he was like a madman, just waiting that when he could run away from home and join the Supreme Lord. And just as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had told, Jai Shri Shri Radha Gopinath, just as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had told Sanatan and Rupa that wait till the right time, he had sent them a beautiful letter. Paravyasini ni nari vyagrapi grihakarmashu Tadeva svadayatyantar navasangar sayanam. He had sent them a letter and said, Paravyasini ni nari, just as there is a girl who is married but may have another lover. Vyagrapi grihakarmashu. What she does is she remains at home in the griha. But what she does is she continues doing all of her duties, but she does them with even more attention so that no one will suspect that she has given her heart to someone else. And so Mahaprabhu told Rupa Sanatan, and he also told Raghunath Das Goswami, Yes, I know your heart longs to be with me, but wait till the right time. Uh, everything has its timeline. For everything, there is a mature time when it should happen. And so... Um, Raghunath Das Goswami was waiting, he was being patient, he began running away, but then he was caught back. Finally, Raghunath Das Goswami went to Panihati, and in Panihati, he got the mercy of Nityananda Prabhu, who said that, yes, very soon you shall be able to take shelter of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And then eventually, Raghunath Das Goswami, he also ran away. Uh, Raghunath Das Goswami ran away, and he came journeying to Jagannath Puri. Uh, his trip, just like Sanatan Goswami's trip, was also an arduous trip. He uh, became so indifferent to everything, uh, only thinking of his goal of meeting Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He only ate uh, once every few days, you know, because of the conditions he was in. But it was no uh, barrier for him. It didn't uh, disenthuse him in any way because his fire of wanting to meet Mahaprabhu was so strong, uh, any amount of inconvenience was inconsequential. So Raghunath Das Goswami arrived in Jagannath Puri. And it's very interesting when Raghunath Das Goswami arrives, then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is extremely happy. And the first thing he does is he puts Raghunath Das Goswami under the care of Swarup Damada. And he calls him, he says, from this day forward, you will be known as Swarupera Raghunath. This is also a very important principle of community building, that when someone comes to the community, there should always be someone to look after them. There should be always somebody they can speak to. There should be always somebody who can um, support them in the very early stages. Uh, everybody needs a mentor, everybody needs a bigger brother or a bigger sister. And we see this in Jagannath Puri when Raghunath Das Goswami comes. The first thing he does is he puts uh, Raghunath Das Goswami under the care of someone. Um, so this is something we can also learn. And then uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gives Raghunath Das Goswami many instructions on how to be a renunciator. Gramya katana shunibe, gramya vartana kahibe, bhalana kaiveyar, bhalana paribe. He says, very, live a very simple life. Uh, don't talk unnecessarily about others. Don't engage in gossip or unnecessary village talks. Uh, don't even hear those things when other people engage in those talks. Uh, don't live very opulently. Don't... Uh, strive for many facilities and conveniences and comforts. Be happy with whatever comes. 
And in this way, your simplicity in your speech, your simplicity in your mind, your simplicity in your habits will allow you to experience the true sweetness of uh, what is actually available to you in this community of love. So Raghunath Das Goswami really takes that to heart. And he becomes so renowned, so detached, so simple. He said he begins in Jagannath Puri by uh, simply uh, begging alms from uh, whichever homes he can receive something from. Later on he becomes more austere, he just goes to a booth and he beg begs alms in that one place. And whatever he receives in that one place he accepts. Later on, he doesn't even beg. He just waits to see what other people will give him. But later on, he feels even that to be um, too much sense gratification. And therefore, he then decides to just take the reject of what the, even the cows won't eat. And then later on, he just has a few drops of buttermilk every day. So this is very, very extreme. But the idea is that Raghunath Das Goswami becomes more and more detached, more and more renounced from facilities, from comforts, from conveniences. He becomes more and more indifferent to any desire for power, for any desire for prestige, any desire for popularity, um, any desire for personal gain or profit. All of these things become so uh, inconsequential to him. And this uh, also teaches us uh, an incredibly important principle of community building. That when there is renunciation and detachment within all the individuals from all of these things that enamor people in the world, then they can really be a community. Otherwise, what will happen is the community of love will descend into um, a type of religious uh, institution that becomes decadent. Therefore, nowadays people say, I'm not into organized religion. It's funny because we like everything else in our life to be organized. When people say, I don't like organized religion, I say, do you like organized hospitals? Yes. Do you like organized schools? Yes. Do you like organized shopping centers? Yes. Uh, we like organized everything, but we don't like organized religion. And it's not that we don't like organized religion, but what we don't like is what we often see comes with organized religion, which is uh, competition for power, prestige, popularity, profit, and all of these things. It's interesting that Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur was the first of the Vaishnava Acharyas to really create a hard spiritual institution. But he was also the one who spoke out against it uh, perhaps most strongly. He writes an article on Putana and uh, organized religion talking about how um, it's a necessary evil, he says. It's necessary because without organization, without structure, without having a community like this, we can't expand, we can't proliferate, we can't uh, share the opportunity of devotion with many people. But the risk is that in this organized religion, it becomes evil because it becomes more about the externals than the internals. It becomes more about the form than the substance. It becomes more about um, external uh, indicators rather than internal devotion. And so he speaks out very, very strongly against all of these things, against uh, power, about, against money. Money has the power to degrade anything. Of course, in the Christian tradition, we hear that the love of money is the root of all evil. If you think about in the world, money has destroyed everything. Money destroys the health system because then the health system becomes not about getting people better, but it just becomes about how to be profitable and efficient. Money uh, destroys the educational system because it no longer becomes the search of knowledge. 
it just becomes what's profitable to push as many numbers through. Uh, money destroys the legal system because it doesn't, uh, it's no longer about what's right or what's just, but it's about how it can be economically uh, beneficial to anyone. Uh, so in all spheres of activity, money has the power to uh, degrade something. And therefore, uh, Raghunath Das Goswami and his example of extreme renunciation and detachment, which comes from spiritual absorption. When there's a lack of spiritual absorption, then naturally there will be more of a uh, diversion and deviation into all of these other things. For example, the Goswamis, their renunciation, more than vairagya, which means renunciation, it's more symbolized by the word virakti, which means that that natural detachment which comes from absorption in the spiritual reality. So for example, some people think the Goswamis were sleeping under a different tree every night because they were showing the example of being an ideal renunciate and not getting attached to any residence. However, the real reason that the Goswamis were sleeping under a different tree every night is because under every different tree in Vrindavan they were being revealed in their minds and hearts of all the different things that Krishna did in that place. And therefore it was natural for them to move from place to place because they were being filled with uh, realizations of Krishna. And this is an example of how when one is spiritually absorbed, then the detachment from the material will naturally come. And so, uh, yes, this is uh, so important that communities degrade um, from the community of love and they come become uh, yeah, they, they, they compromise their principles when there is not sufficient uh, detachment from uh, the material goals that enamor people, puja, pratish, stadi, uh, all of these things that Mahaprabhu said are weeds which grow with the creeper of bhakti. So like this, we kind of, as we go through the antilila, we're building a picture of uh, what the community of love is and and, and all these different uh, ingredients. So um, I think let me pause here and see uh, whether there may be any questions, comments, or perhaps anything I've uh, said that you would like to uh, perhaps uh, discuss further. Hare Krishna, thank you very much. Can I ask a question about yesterday? Or you asked me a question, but it uh, it piqued um, my curiosity. When you uh, when you showed us the verse, I think it was um, of um, I'm not sure if it was from Bhagavatamri or, or Aridas Thakur who explained the verse uh, Chaitanya. Yes, Rupa Goswami. Yes. yes. And um, in the end, he talked about the, the fifth note of his flute. Oh. <laughs> and he picked up my curiosity as a, as a musician. Yeah, there's, an, there's actually a name for the fifth note um, in music. Uh, and uh, and it, is it Tibra or something like that? Is that in music? I don't know if anyone knows music. The pancha means five, yeah. But th there's a specific note, and it and it uh, is there's a name of it, and it kind of uh, corresponds with the Sanskrit word divra, which means intensity. Um, I don't know. Someone told me at I once. Think, I um, think the scale, uh, the Indian scale is sarigama padami. Yeah, no, this is in Western music. Um, anyway. That I'll put that to one side. Like you can see clearly I'm not musical. Um, but someone had told me once. But the idea is that this fifth note is a, is a note in which... Uh, you, you say, for example, in a musical composition, you know, like a, a song goes through ups and downs, and then there's certain notes which heighten the emotions. 
and uh, it's uh, all the other notes support to bring it to that note like for example sometimes someone is in a kirtan and they're singing a particular tune and then they hit one kind of chord which really resonates with your heart and at that time there's a kind of an, a, uh, a kind of overflowing of the emotion so it said that when Krishna plays the flute then uh, of course it's, it's extremely beautiful but then when he plays the fifth note this is almost like the crescendo and, and creates a, 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 an extra trigger within the hearts of the gopis which uh, kind of attract their attention and their heart to him in an uncontrollable way and so yeah this fifth note is uh, is described uh, throughout the Vedic literature of Krishna's uh, secret weapon to bring about uh, even heightened emotions in an already emotional state. Like okay. Good morning, Maharaj. Thank you for the class. When you talk about renunciation and detachment in this present time here, for example, in Radhadesh or the community, <clears throat> How do you renounce when you still need the money from the people who come to build um, greenhouse, goshala, buy cows? So it, at the same time you accept the abundance people, the visitors, um, non Vaishnav brings to create the community, but at the same time you have to be detached from from money and all. So I know it's an inner journey inside for everyone, but in the practicality of community, as we talked yesterday, we need more powers of people to help, we need more building for young people to come as a community is a bit in different place, a bit older. So how do you dance with those two and stay in the middle way and not get enamored by the power or it can create for some people, perhaps even in ISKCON, you know? And uh, how do you deal with that balance? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's an important point. Um, the first thing is that Krishna Bhakti, Krishna Prem, Seva Pravartan, when the Goswamis started that culture of building all these beautiful temples and we follow in that line, the idea is that those temples were meant to be seva pravartan, uh, centers of service where they could people could come and render their service. And it's said in Vaishnava Shastra that there are different ways to render service. Um Dehi Nami Hadehi Shu Praner Arther Dhya Vacha Shreya Acharanam Sada that our life becomes fruitful when we can serve. And how do we serve? Praner, by your energy, you can do something for Krishna. Artha, by your wealth, you can dedicate that to Krishna. Dhya, your intelligence, you can use that for Krishna. And Vacha, your words, um, you can also, through your words, serve uh, in a community. So Artha and giving people the opportunity to Dedicate their wealth to Krishna is also a very beautiful opportunity that we give to people to serve because uh, it purifies their wealth. Um, when that wealth is used uh, in charity uh, for the purpose of service to Krishna and Vaishnavas, then that wealth becomes purified and one's life becomes purified. Um, and therefore, sometimes, even though wealth may come from questionable places, of course, we take comfort in the fact that because it's being dedicated in the right place, um, it will also have a good effect in helping that person to purify their own life. But yes, we have to, we have to build projects, we need money, we need resources, and how do we balance that? Because sometimes people come and, and they perceive us to not be so renounced or detached. They perceive us to be constantly asking for money, asking for donations, uh, asking for so many things. And of course, we may also have a very good motivation. We're doing it to expand Krishna's service. But how do people 
perceive that. So yes, that's very, very sensitive. The principle is that if we serve, if we serve people and touch their hearts, um, then they will give everything. Uh, we won't even have to ask them. Uh, that's the highest spiritual principle. And then there's the practicality that we also have to pay the bills every month and therefore we have to also ask because sometimes people may take a long time to have that change of heart. So therefore we have to gently encourage them. So how to balance that is a great art. But in our heart we should always try to serve people. Um, when we try to serve then uh, Artha will come. Um, like I remember in one marathon, uh, you know, mar marathons are the time when we try to do big. So I remember once we, there was a, at the manor there was a marathon and what they would do is every morning all the fundraisers would come in and they'd divide up all the contacts of where to go, you know, that week so that so everyone would be vying for the best contacts where you could, you know, collect the most, you know. So that week on a Monday morning, one amongst all the contacts, one contact had come in from a lady. She was like three and a half hours away. She had written on, you know, like a very kind of torn piece of paper. She had written a letter and she was saying, you know, like, uh, yeah, I never get the chance to meet devotees. I'm, uh, I'm, I really wish to meet the devotees and I, I need someone to discuss my problems with and like that. So, you know, amongst all the collectors, it didn't sound like the most spiritually lucrative <laughs> contact, you know. So that contact kind of get left, left to the last, you know. And then one devotee, he was just, he, I always remember this devotee because he had no, he was never calculative. So he was just like, no, no, she's sincere and it may take me three, I'll do that one, I'll take that one. You know, so everyone was kind of like, that's going to take you a whole day to drive there and back, you're going to lose a whole day. He said, no, it's okay, we serve the people. Anyway, he went there to meet her and... Uh, so he spent like three hours with her, he answered all her questions, everything, and, uh, and then as he was, he didn't even ask her for anything, and as he was leaving, um, she just kind of said, yeah, just before you go, just a small donation, for you should get a tiny envelope if it was something. He got back, he didn't even open the envelope because he wasn't expecting anything, and uh, the next morning he came in into the office and she just said like, who gave you that hundred thousand pound donation? <laughs> and he was like, what hundred thousand pound donation? <laughs> and everyone was shocked, you know, like, because he went with no expectation. He went with no kind of, he just went to serve. And, you know, when you conquer people's hearts, then they give, you know, everything. So, so yeah, it's, uh, but then, yeah, we have to be practical, we have to ask. But the main thing is we should give people an opportunity to serve when we've got to be interested in the people. If we're interested in the people, then they will also give everything. So, yeah, that's a delicate balance. Godruma, Godruma, Godruma Prabhu. What are your thoughts on our edu educational system? Oh wow. <laughs> yes, uh, Yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, of course, now there are many alternative educational systems out there. We were just in Holland and we did a program at a Montessori school. So that was very interesting to see another approach to education. But yeah, unfortunately, mainstream education, um, unfortunately, has become somewhat of a conveyor belt. You know, it's somewhat of just a uh, system that people go through. It, it perhaps lacks a bit of personal touch. It lacks a bit of that um, understanding every student as an individual, understanding what their dharma is, understanding what natural strengths they have and what 
on things that they can thrive in. And instead of uh, working on those and allowing people to follow their dharma and unleash their dharma, we just try to teach people a little bit of everything and perhaps not much of anything. They say in the modern educational system now, we don't, we teach people what to think, we don't teach them how to think. And therefore, yeah, there's definitely a lot to be said. You know, even university, I went to university, to me it felt like just a, a time of memorization. Just memorizing things to pass exams, to then get certificates, to then move on in your life. And, and how much did I learn throughout that whole thing? So yeah, I don't want to sit here and speak out against the whole educational system because perhaps there are. But definitely there's an impersonalism that enters our educational system which perhaps stops it from actually being a powerful agent in unleashing the unique potential that every individual has and um, definitely something that needs to be looked at. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Maharaj, my question is about detachment, because you mentioned about detachment, and then you also mentioned about the weeds in the creeper of bhakti, the Pratishtha and Baba. Um, could it mean that this detachment uh, is also, could it also apply being detached from the weeds that appear in your spiritual life? Um, could you elaborate, put some light? Sorry, if I'm not. Yeah, so according to the analogy that Rupa Goswami delineates in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, our creeper of uh, our, our devotion is like a creeper, a plant that's growing, and as we water that plant, Shravana Kirtana Jale, as we water that plant by the process of hearing and chanting, then along with the plant growing, as we know, weeds also grow. And sometimes if we're not uh, careful, those weeds can overpower the main plant and actually choke it. So the idea is that when we practice devotional service, then many, many side benefits come. Uh, you get the opportunity in the Krishna consciousness movement very quickly for position. You get the opportunity to enjoy many, many side benefits. There may be popularity which comes, prestige. Um, so all of these things come and to be detached means that those things are there they're the, um, the things that just come along with the development of anyone's devotion and the detachment means to be able to honor them and use them in so far as they're useful to one's service to Krishna to use whatever facilities come in the process of devotional service for the purpose of service and not try to enjoy those things. Nirbandha, uh, Krishna Sambande, Yuktam Vairagya Muchate. So whenever those, whatever things appear in our life to understand the Hari Sambandha, the connection to Krishna and employ them appropriately, that's the type of detachment that we're trying to inculcate. Maharaj, you were you were um, presenting uh, different cultures, they have different ways of um, function, yeah, so, expression. Yes, and um, so Prabhupada introduced the spiritual culture, spiritual principles. Uh, it seems with it also a lot of Indian elements came in. Not that sometimes not even that Prabhupada introduced them, but for example, wearing dhotis. Apparently, there were his disciples asking him if they can wear dotis, they can, if they can dress like him. Um, so, um, do you think that, um, for example, and of course, the movement is international, and in some places, for example, um, would it be uh, perhaps um, 
In some places, movement could be seen as a kind of Indian movement, you could say. Um, although the spiritual culture or, and philosophy is universal, so uh, wouldn't it be um, perhaps interesting to adopt more to a local culture, for example, uh, without abandoning the spiritual principles, for example? Yeah, I thought somebody would raise this. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, we have to separate between Indian culture and the culture of the spiritual world. Of course, the culture of the spiritual world is rooted in India because the Dham and uh, where Krishna appeared and the, you know, the center of that Vedic culture was Bharat. And therefore, sometimes that line between what is Indian and what is Vedic, what is Indian and what is truly the spiritual, uh, the culture of the spiritual world, sometimes that's a little difficult to distinguish. Um, and ultimately, what you said, that we take the best from everywhere. So Srila Prabhupada, often he said, India is like a lame man and the West is like a blind man. Uh, in other words, the West has facility often, but maybe lacks in certain aspects of vision, and perhaps India has vision or has certain, but lacks in, you know, uh, infrastructure and organization, and how can they combine to kind of help and facilitate each other? So it's not that any culture is inherently bad, but it's about taking the elements of those culture which promote spiritual culture. So, for example, Krishna talks in the Bhagavad Gita about eating food in the mode of goodness. He said food which is fresh, food which is, uh, increases one's lifespan, uh, food which energizes and gives ayu and uh, you know, nourishes the body, this is food in the mode of goodness. So, for example, if we take a cuisine around the world which conforms to all of those things and then we prepare it and offer it to Krishna, uh, is it any less spiritual? No. Because it's uh, the purified culture of any given geography which is then offered to Krishna in a spirit of devotion. And so Srila Prabhupada was also ready to do that. He was ready to rename, you know, to go to America and call the sun, you know, the Sunday program, the Love Feast. He was ready to create a program called Stay High Forever. You know, he was ready to describe Krishna consciousness and express it. And, you know, there's that famous story in LA of how the devotees bought that church. And Prabhupada almost in a revolutionary way said, uh, keep the pews, keep the organ let people come in with their shoes and do the kirtan on the organ. Krishna Jan played the kirtan on the organ. <laughs> Interesting. Perhaps it was too far out for the devotees, they didn't do it. They took it all out and they made it like a temple. Baba did say that. He said you can keep the pews in. And so there's always, uh, so this is an ongoing uh, tension, perhaps a healthy tension in our movement that as long as we can navigate this discussion with maturity, with respect and be able to hear from each other, it's a good tension to explore because we have to preserve and at the same time we have to adapt. We have to preserve the essence of what the of culture of uh, your is basically delivering to us and at the same time we have to adapt to a world um, in which there is a culture that you know but at the same time we can't just uh, lose you know they say the person who marries the culture of the today becomes a widow tomorrow because those cultures are also constantly adapting so how to navigate that that's an ongoing the difference between a principle and a detail, that's the $64 million question. And when Shuddha Kirti Prabhu asked Prabhupada, what is the difference between a principle that's unchangeable and a detail that can be adjusted, 
Prabhupada was very quiet for a long time and then he said, that requires a little intelligence. <laughs> so where does that intelligence come from? Healthy dialogue, respect and, and, and ultimately seeing the results of what works. Um, it's a tightrope. That's my diplomatic answer. <laughs> Leave my opinions to Maybe one side. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, a little bit about etiquette, so Vedic etiquette in the Western culture, like we were just talking about, but more about the relationship with the spiritual master and maybe a little context because I grew up in Iskon and at that time I was still a I to remember we used to have massive kirtans when gurus would arrive and we would, as children, run after the car and we, when we had big seminars we would actually recognize whose shoes were who, whose guru was which hat belonged to which shoes and we would have races to try and dive and catch the shoes first and we drink the water from Maharaja's feet and be waiting for Mahaprasadam and I still remember that exhilarating feeling that that gave that surrender and as you become teenagers there's a little bit of skepticism that arises you know a little bit more of history and and so a little bit how do we find that balance that that's finding that surrender and at the same time remaining um, I also respectful in this, uh, let's say, touristic environment where I remember uh, Kala Makarna Maharaj would also say, you know, if there's a lot of guests, please don't bow down because it makes them uncomfortable. And I even notice sometimes for some uh, groups it is uncomfortable to have people bowing down. So how do we maintain that? Uh, yeah, it's... Um, <laughs> they say the respect of a disciple should flow up like smoke. And... Uh, grace of the Guru should flow down like a waterfall. It's a very, very beautiful thing when between teacher and student there is a great relationship of respect, a natural relationship of respect. Because that respect allows such an exchange of uh, mercy and love and inspiration. Um, yet sometimes what happens is it can become very artificial the way in which we try to force that. And at the same time, if there's not some level of culture that we do, even when we don't feel like it, it goes to the other extreme of being so unregulated that we miss out on the opportunity that is available in that relationship. So what tends to happen in society is we go from extremes, we go from something that is, seems like so artificially imposed that later on breaks down and then we seem to go to the other extreme of just uh, removing all kind of social construct around something and we have to somehow find the golden mean of how we can um, have that respect in a very very natural and an organic way uh, a way which feels uh, comfortable on both sides and which also allows for the exchange that's meant to happen um, the interesting thing is in the Bhagavatam it's also mentioned Guru Sudrida Saurida that the Guru is not just an object of reverence and respect but simultaneously one must have a firm relationship of friendship with the Guru and that's very interesting that the Bhagavatam says that um, because in any relationship there are two elements, Vishram Vena and Gauda Vena, which means reverence and also some level of intimacy. And if it goes on one of two extremes, if there's too much reverence, it becomes lax personalism. And if it becomes too uh, intimate without that respect, it lacks um, that respect which, in which authority is carried. So yeah, finding that balance and I think um, the movement goes through situations where we're forced to find that balance and uh, maybe we do go a little bit like that and then come back and you know, like a pendulum it kind of eventually kind of settles somewhere. So um, yeah, I think it's just about being mature and again looking at the principles of the culture rather than focusing so much immediately on the externals and then finding an appropriate way to express those uh, principles. I see there are more hands but I'm just conscious of time. Okay, sure.
Okay, maybe one last one. And then. I was just wondering, because Verdana Sinatra Das Goswami, they came from a rich family, and they uh, already along the way to Jagannath Puri, they were doing a lot of austerities. Now. Mm. How could they make this such a fast switch to this kind of particular different life? Yeah, it's, 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 it's incredible. Srinivas Acharya says, Pyakva Turna Mashesha Mandala Pati Shrenim Sada Tuchava. They just kicked it off. He, he uses those words. He said they kicked it off. It wasn't even progressive. You know, it was just like they just threw it off. And they immediately, it almost just feels like overnight they just became mendicants. And it's only possible to do that level of um, change if one is already experiencing a bhav within. See, because for us to make that kind of drastic change, it doesn't really work because we don't have that level of awakening of bhav. Therefore, our, it's more like, our detachment is more like the sun setting, you know. It just has to kind of go through its natural course and then gradually we kind of let go. But for them, because they were already in Bhav, even while living, they were almost just uh, completely detached from it. And therefore, to externally, if the internal detachment is there, then the external change is very easy. But if that internal is not there, then the external becomes very, very harsh. Um, so yeah, they kicked it off. Srinivas Acharya says, because viraktir, uh, mana shunyata, it's a symptom of bhav that you just become indifferent. So, yeah. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, when he created the Bhag Bazaar temple, which was very opulent, and the devotees were fighting, and he said, there'll be fire in the math, because everyone's now fighting um, over these rooms. He said, he once said, the difference between me and Mahaprabhu was that Mahaprabhu turned princes into paupers. But what I've done is I've taken paupers and I've made them into princes. Because he, he took people who are from very simple Bengali families and he made this Bhag Bazaar temple and they came to the movement and they were living a level of opulence they never had before. So he said, it's no wonder that you're fighting. Because again, these things have come in. Um, so yeah, uh, that level is possible of detachment when one has deep spiritual taste. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Srila Prabhupada ki. Chaitanya Charita Amrita ki.